continue with our Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we're asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We're asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The Book of the Prophet Isaiah The Book of the Prophet Isaiah Chapter 19 Chapter 19 The Burden of Egypt Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother, and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof. And they shall seek to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards. And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. And they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up, the reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brooks shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax, and they that weave networks, shall be confounded. And they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they? Where are thy wise men? And let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Nof are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that are the stay of the tribes thereof. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. Neither shall there be any work for Egypt, which the head or tail, branch or rush, may do. In that day shall Egypt be like unto women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan, and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord, and perform it. And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. 
In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Chapter 20 In the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and fought against Ashdod, and took it, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years, for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners, and the Ethiopians captives. Young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia their expectation, and of Egypt their glory. And the inhabitant of this isle shall say in that day, Behold, such is our expectation, whither we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria. And how shall we escape? Chapter 21 The Burden of the Desert of the Sea As whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the sighing thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table. Watch in the watchtower. Eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. And he cried, A lion! My Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. O oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. The Burden of Duma He calleth to me out of Seir, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye. Return, come. The Burden Upon Arabia In the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of Dedanim. The inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled. For they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, and all the glory of Kedar shall fail. And the residue of the number of archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished, for the Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. You have just listened to the Bible reading. And we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray.
close and I have to say you are a nesting lion no matter what I tell you you don't love me less and it shows you're the truest friend of mine on this narrow road of fate I don't want to be unwise straight into the feet of Work with me. Make us one 
in a practical way in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for your faithfulness, always revealing your mind to us. And when you reveal your truth and your mind, you always give us the grace. When we claim that grace, we're asking, Lord, that tonight your word will be plain and clear to everyone in Jesus' name. And whatever may be in us, which is not according to your word, according to your will, that you remove everything in Jesus' name, that according to your word, and according to the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, in a very definite way, as the Father and the Son are one, will be perfectly united in one in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Tonight we are continuing our study in the epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. And now we are in chapter 12 and we are studying from verse 12 to verse 31. Let's look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, For as the body is one, and as many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So also is the body of Christ, so also is the church. Look at verse 18. In verse 18 it says, But now, as God said, the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. Then in verse 24, it tells us in verse 24, it says, For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which large. Verse 28, in verse 28, it says, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Verse 31, in verse 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. You'll see in those selected verses that the body of Christ is one. The church is one. As the body is one, with all the many members having various functions and different functions, the Lord makes us to be one so that we can cooperate together, coordinate together, and then we'll move the body forward. And then it says, all the functions of the members of the body, they remain as God himself as said every member in the body and then he even talks about the ministers in that verse 28 he said the lord himself has said those ministers the way they are the functions they have and the ministries they have and then it says in verse 31 covered honestly the best gifts what does that mean that as you see your position and your place in the body where he has set you then you will covet honestly the best gifts that will make you function appropriately in the place that the Lord himself has set you. Today we're looking at the message, the unity and usefulness of members of the body. The usefulness of members of the body. When the member and when the minister abides and stays in the calling the Lord has set him in, then he will be useful and then he's united, he's cooperating with all the other members of the body who are also having their own function and their own roles and their own responsibilities. As we're united together like that, then we have the usefulness of all the members 
organs and they contribute to the health of the body to the happiness of the body and to the progress of the body and to the purposeful pursuit of the body unity on the one hand of the usefulness if we're united but we're not useful that's not enough if you are useful and we're not united that's not enough there must be a combination of the usefulness and the unity of the members so that the body of christ and the church of the living god can make progress and be what he wants us to be where he wants us to be and achieve for him and for his glory all that he wants us to achieve the unity and the usefulness of members of the body there are three things we're looking at number one purposeful relationship of members as such by god it's the lord that said uh, all those members and then we have relationship but it is a purposeful relationship of all the members as the lord himself has said for the church number two practical righteousness of members as specified by god practical righteousness there's a kind of righteousness that is theoretical and there's a kind of righteousness that is superficial there's a kind of righteousness that is hidden we cannot see it but this one that the lord is calling the members of the church to is practical righteousness of the members as specified by god point number three will be prescribed responsibilities of ministers as sealed by god the Lord has given those responsibilities and he has sealed them so that I cannot change those responsibilities. You cannot change those responsibilities. They are sealed by the Lord himself and he has given the specifications as to how we serve and what we do and how we minister so we all cooperate together in serving the way the lord himself has given us the word and has sealed it that we serve in that way let's come to point number one is the purposeful relationship of members as such by God. We're coming to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 12. It says in verse 12, uh, For as the body is one, and as many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so is Christ. In verse 21, uh, it tells us in verse 21, it says, The eye cannot say, unto the hand i have no need of thee nor again the head to the feet i have no need of thee it brings us into relationship together and the relationship is purposeful and it is the lord that has set such relationship for members of a physical body and then for the members of his mystic body that he is of the body of christ three things we're looking at here number one converted baptized members saved by grace we cannot just say we're members of his body if we're not converted all have seen that come short of the glory of god and it is the salvation the conversion we have by the grace of god that brings us integrates us into the body to become members of the body of christ number one then converted baptized members saved by grace number two crucified buried members selfless and godly when we're coming to the body of christ as children of god the self will still be there even after salvation the depravity will be there after salvation but then we come to god for the second work of grace and that self that adamic nature that depravity is crucified and is dead and is buried then we become selfless and godly number three consecrated 
beneficial members search for good. The members of the body who are saved, who are sanctified, they now consecrate everything to the Lord that they will become of benefit to the whole body of Christ and they search their mind for the good of the body, the good of the church. Let's look at number one, converted, baptized members, saved by grace. It tells us in verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. As you think about water baptism, you also think about the spirit baptism. We are baptized into one body by the spirit that he is as you are born again you confess your sin you forsake your sin you turn to the lord and you are born again the spirit of god takes us and he mercies us into the body integrates us into the body and that integration to the body is what is referred to as being baptized into one body whether we're Jews or Gentile, there's no Jewish church and Gentile church. The Jewish people and the Gentile people, when they are born again, they are part of the same body, the same church. Whether we are born or free, there are no slaves and free people in the kingdom of God. As you come, we're all one in Christ, male and female, young and old, all those who are born again will become part of this one body. Look at Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 3. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, this referring to water baptism, the Lord himself said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's water baptism. The question for you is, have you been baptized in water since you became born again? Have you surrendered yourself, submitted yourself, and carried both soul, spirit, and body? And according to the word of God, you obey the word of God, and you are baptized in water. That makes you a member of the body of Christ. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That he is the water baptism is not by sprinkling. You are immersed, you are buried into the water and then you come out. Then it says in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life that's the evidence that we're converted you are converted you are baptized in water and you identify with christ in that water baptism and then the grace of god is now in you converted baptized and saved by grace and now you walk in newness of life in verse 5 it tells us for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection the power of the spirit of god turns our lives around and then we walk in the likeness of his resurrection all this by grace titus chapter 2 reading from verse 11 for by grace eh, for the grace of god that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men that salvation is for all and the moment you accept and the moment you believe and the moment you receive uh, that grace works in your life and this is the result of the grace look at verse 12 uh, it says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly 
you have repented you have believed on the lord jesus christ you have been baptized in water you identified with christ now you deny ungodliness and worldly laws that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world temptations are in this present world but the grace of God is available and that grace is sufficient and will make you an overcomer so that in this present world you live soberly, you live righteously and you live godly. Then in verse 13 it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, verse 14, who gave himself for us that that we that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works let's come to number two here and his crucified buried members selfless and godly uh, look at first corinthians chapter uh, 12 reading from verse 15 if the foot shall say because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. You see, therefore, not of the body. You see, when we're born again, and then we go to the Lord, and self is crucified, and self crucified and dead is buried, and we're sanctified and selfless. There is no carnal comparison anymore. And so the hand, uh, if you are the active member of the church, cannot say unto, uh, the, unto the foot, if you are the progressive moving member of the church, one cannot say to the other, I don't have need of you. There is no jealousy, there is no envy, there is no carnal comparison, and there is no competition in the body of Christ. Then it says in verse 16, it says, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. He said, therefore not of the body. If a member of the church will then retreat and reverse, and then he will say, because my role, my responsibility is not like his role. It's not like her role. Therefore, I'm not going to do anything to contribute to the progress of the body. The members of the body don't do that. And when we come to Christ, we're saved and we're sanctified. And the old Adamic nature is uh, crucified and totally taken away. We're not telling the other person, you are not important, I'm important. And he is not telling us, you are not important, I'm important. All the members will work together perfectly. In verse 17, it says, if the whole body were an eye, where were the earring? If the eye becomes uh, so important, I see, I see, I can see. And then you feel that the ear is not important, the mouth is not important. Where will be the whole body? It is that the various members function together harmoniously and unitedly, cooperatively, purposefully. That's when you have the whole body uh, working properly. If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Look at verse 18 now. But now, as God said, the members, every one of them in the body, when we're saved, when we're sanctified, all we need to do is to be praising God, thanking God, not comparing, not saying, I'm not happy where God has set me. I'm not happy where God has put me. But we look at what we're doing and then we get the best gifts of God to be the best in that area God has appointed us. And we're so grateful to God that even me, of all people, I can be allowed to do this because of that. We're giving glory to God and we're not complaining because the Lord in his wisdom, the Lord in his love, and the Lord in his foresight, he knew what you will be and he knew what you will best contribute to the body of Christ. But now, as God said, the members, every one of them in the body as 
it has pleased him not as it has pleased you not as it has pleased other people not as it has pleased your friends or your brethren or your relatives blood relations no the lord has set everyone in the body as it has pleased him all we can say is that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven in romans chapter 6 reading from verse 6 it says knowing this that our old man is crucified with him our old character is crucified with him our old habit is crucified with him our old nature is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed the very nucleus of sin the very root of sin and the very body of sin destroyed that henceforth we shall not serve sin and then it says in verse 7 it says for he that is dead is freed from sin if you have identified where Christ you are crucified if you have identified with Christ that you are dead with him it says he that is dead is freed from sin then it tells us in verse 11 in verse 11 it says likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord I pray the Lord will effect that in every one of our lives in Jesus name Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory. What's he telling us there? Whatever I do by strife will not be recognized by God as a good work. And it will not be rewarded. So if I spend my life, the major part of my life striving and then having vain glory all those things i do in strive and vain glory whatever good it may appear to have done to the body of christ is not it's not recognized by god let nothing be done through strive of vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves when i esteem other people better than myself and i give glory to god on their behalf i'm happy they're doing what they're doing they're happy i'm doing what i'm doing that's the unity of the body and then in verse 4 it says it says look not everyone every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others that's telling us that we should want the other brother to succeed we should want the other sister to succeed we're not just looking at what i'm doing i want to be my best i want to be high i want to be good i want to have my life busy and doing something great we want to look at other people that they will be useful that they will be uplifted and that they too will be happy in what god has said them to do look not every man on his own things but every man also on the thing of others how will that happen in verse 5 let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus that's how to do it let the mind of Christ be in you the mind of love and the mind of appreciating other people and the mind of raising them of lifting them up so that they will be all the Lord has called them to be we're looking at number three now number three is the consecrated beneficial members search for good the member of the, the member of the body of Christ like any of the members of the hand shall say the Lord has set me here for good for good in one sense only to do good only to contribute to the progress of the body of Christ 
for good permanent until God moves you to another level and to another area you say I am here for good for this is how God has set me look at first Corinthians chapter 12 reading from verse 18 but now as God set the members every one of them in the body as it has pleased him if you grumble if you complain if you strive if you fight if you become political that he is you are campaigning and you become a politician in the church a politician in the body of christ it means that you are saying you don't accept what god has done God has set everyone members as it has pleased him. What pleases the Lord has not pleased you. And you are looking beyond what God has done. And you are blaming God. Why have you done this? Why did you put me here? What did so and so have that I don't have? And what can so and so do that I cannot do? We shouldn't do that. Once you are in the hand of God and you are in the body of Christ, to start with, even to be saved, to be born again, is by grace, not by marriage. And then to become a serving member in the body of Christ is by grace and it is not by marriage. You just thank God because God has set members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him. Look at verse 19. And if they were all one member doing the same thing, having the same responsibility, where was the whole body? Will not some responsibility in the church be overlooked, be neglected? Look at verse 20. In verse 20, but now there are many members, yet but one body. Many members, different responsibilities, yet it is one body. And then it says in verse 21, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. They walk together and they cooperate together. No, again, the head to the feet, the highest to the lowest, I have no need of you. This is what God has done, and we're glorifying God for that. Look at Job chapter 29, reading from verse 12. Job chapter 29, we're reading from verse 12, Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. Verse 13, it says, The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Verse 14, I put on righteousness, and it closed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. Look at verse 15, a very important. I was eyes to the blind. That's our responsibility. If the eye is there in the body, you see those who are blind, and then you guide them, you teach them, you instruct them, you show them the way. I was eyes to the blind, and feet was I to the lame. And those who are lame, you understand, the eyes may not be able to help them. But the people that have feet, they can carry them on their shoulders. And it says, I was feet to the lame, I was eyes to the blind. That's the work he has called us to do in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship. He has created all like that, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. That's the ordination of God. That's the way God has set members in the body. And I pray God will grant us abundance of grace. We will fulfill our calling as such by God in Jesus' name. Did I hear a good amen?
Number two now, number two, practical righteousness of members as specified by God. Now, you need to understand you are part of the body of Christ and the Lord has set us so and he wants us to have righteousness, practical righteousness of members as specified by God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 22, nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. The members of the body which appear to be more feeble are necessary. There are some parts of the body that are delicate. For example, our eyes, any little uh, grain of sand that gets into the eye will make us feel the discomfort because it's feeble, it is delicate. And there are other parts of the body too. A little boil in any part of the body can so disorganize you because it makes that area feeble. But you know, we don't cut, we don't pull out the tooth where anytime you are eating and you bite your tongue or you bite your cheek. You don't say, well, that is, that is bad. You've done it before. I won't tolerate that again. Pull it out and throw it out. If we did that, some of us will have no tooth left in our mouth. They will care for them. They're still necessary. The same thing with members of the body of Christ. We don't throw that one away because of this. He is necessary and she is necessary. And when we think of all the members of the body of Christ like that, everyone will feel their place. Everyone will be useful in their calling. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the compassion of members towards the feeble the compassion of members towards the feeble number two the care of members within the flock all of us were the forge of Christ were the flock of Christ and we need to have the care of members within the flock number three the character of members as his followers he calls us to follow him and so we are not people that are following our mind following our instincts and following whatever we want to do we look at christ looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith and we're following him and that determines our character look at number one the compassion of members towards the feeble we're looking at uh, Job chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Job chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. That's what we do to do your feeble. You see, any member of the church, any member of the house fellowship, any member of the choir, any member of uh, ushers, any section at all, you know, we're not stone. Somebody might become weak, might become sick, might become feeble. We're not to trample on them. We're not to push them down. We're to strengthen them, strengthen the weak hands. Look at verse 4. It says in verse 4, Thy words are upholding him that was falling that's what we need to do as we may as we minister as members of the body to one another and thou are strengthened the feeble knees i pray god will help us to remember to do that every time in jesus name we will not gossip about members who are feeble we will not backbite members who are feeble we will not criticize or condemn members who are feeble. Our responsibility is to see what can I contribute to his life, what can I contribute to her life that will make her strong or stronger. And look at Isaiah chapter 35, reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm 
the feeble knees strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees now you need to remember when you say something you know, although the brother you are talking about may not be there the sister you are talking about may not be there one way or the other words go around and the things you say in your private corner may get to the brother you spoke about or the sister you spoke about the question is will this encourage him he's not here <clears throat> and i'm talking about him is not here and uh, we're discussing about him if he happens to hear all that we're saying here will that confirm the feeble knees will that strengthen the weak hands always think about that and the lord will make you to positively contribute to the strength and to the grace of god in other people's lives in jesus name First Thessalonians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. And when you warn people, if somebody is unruly, you don't want the person in an unruly manner. Somebody is acting angry, you don't want him also with anger. You will have a gentle disposition. If somebody is going wrong, the way to help bring that person back is what the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy, and then you are positive and you want the best for them. That's how to want comfort the feeble-minded don't condemn them what happened that you are so feeble why is it you are not like that why is it you are not like that if that happened to me i know what i will do you that's not how to comfort people you comfort them you come inside their skin you see what their challenges are and what their difficulties are and then you have a word of comfort a word of a hell a word that will encourage Encourage him and bring him up. Support the weak. Be patient towards all men. Be patient towards all men. Don't jump into conclusion. Don't bounce on people. You know, human beings are delicate. Understand, we have feeling. Understand, we have challenges. And as you are helping people, you are patient towards all men. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. The other time I was feeble, this is the way he dealt with me. And I almost ran away from the fold. And now he is feeble and I'm strong I remember what he did I'm going to throw back a stone unto him don't do that see that none render evil for evil unto any man but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men let's look at number two here number two the care of members within the flock we're coming to first corinthians chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 25 24 it says for our comely parts have no need but god has tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which large it looks like many people are different from god God gives abundant honor to that part which large. As we look at, at our fellowship, our relationship together, uh, sometimes my, uh, somebody might lack maybe communication ability. Somebody might lack a kind of practical wisdom, uh, what he ought to do. And the people who lack, we seem to look down on them and we seem to brush them aside because of their lack. God is not like that. And as we follow God and as we depend upon God and we want to be more and more faithful followers of God, here is what God has done. He has given more abundant honor to that part which lack. 
and that's what we ought to do look at verse 25 it says that there should be no schism no division no disagreement no, no discord in the body but that the members should have the same care one for another the members should have the same care one for another there should be no tribalism the members should have the same care one for another is born again she's born again he's not from the same tribe she's not from the same tribe the members should have the same care one for another i cannot stay in that district the leader there is not from our place and he doesn't understand my dialect or my local language we should have the same care one for another look away from tribe and look away from all the things that divide us the blood of jesus that washed us and cleansed us and saved us has made us one let us remain one in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 16 second corinthians chapter 8 we're reading from verse 16 but thanks be to god which has put the same earnest care into the heart of titus for you god be praised because that same god who knows your need and knows the heart of titus and titus can supply that he puts the same earnest care into the heart of titus for you when we talk of care if the care is sluggish if the care is slow, if the care is delayed, the fellow might have passed through the need and all that before we even get to him. But if we know that this person has need now and we are not looking here and there earnestly and quickly and swiftly, we supply that care. That's what the Lord is teaching us there in verse 17. It says, For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. He went unto you. There are people uh, that say, I want to visit uh, sister so-and-so. I want to visit brother so-and-so. I want to visit this family. And I know that they need food, but I'm waiting. I will tell our group pastor before I go. They want to tell everybody before they can go. While the person is suffering with hunger and the hunger is biting the whole family and they cannot feed or take care of the children, the family very well, they are waiting for permission. And before they get to the group pastor or the pastor or the overseer, the fellow is already drowning in the sea of problem. But you have honest care and because of honest care you are more forward and you know this is the need and you meet the need at that point and the Lord will reward your sacrifice in Jesus name and look at verse 21 in verse 21 providing for honest things that's what we do you provide for the honest needs of people not only in the sight of the Lord but also in the sight of all men let's come to number three here number three is the character of members as his followers while looking at a first corinthians chapter 12 verse 26 first corinthians chapter 12 verse 26 and whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it if one member is suffering there are many, many areas of suffering once we open our eyes we will see and once we open our ears we will hear and once we visit each other or telephone each other we will see what the need is and we will see if we're open to each other and if we're frank with each other we will know when another member is suffering and whether one member 
suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And then it goes on in verse 27, it says, But now are ye the body of Christ and members in particular. Always be conscious of that. I am a member of the body. And I must be doing something. I must be contributing you know, to the progress of the body. It tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with them that rejoice. And weep with them that weep. What does that mean to weep with them that weep? And do I just say, you know, go to the house of somebody who is weeping and as I step at the door, I then begin to weep, I begin to cry cro cro crocodile tears? No, I look at what is making him to weep and I put myself in his shoes, in her shoes. And then if I can solve that problem in identifying with those who are weeping, I go to their houses and then I empathize, I sympathize, I identify with them and I supply the need. The Lord give us wisdom. The Lord give you wisdom. And let's look at Galatians chapter 6. We're reading from verse 2. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Bear ye one another's bodies. Don't say that's his uh, responsibility. He needs to bear his own body. Now. Um, I don't know why he's in that need. He's not telling us to look underneath the carpet and be finding out why is he going through that? Why is he going through that? Where the knowledge is going through a body, under a body. Bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, let us not be weary in well doing. Am I the only one I helped, brother so and so? That's your calling. I helped sister so and so. That's your calling. I helped that family. That's your calling. And God has so positioned you. And he has blessed you that your own needs are met and you have extra to spare. It says, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Look at verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, be looking for opportunity. Opportunity to help opportunity to lift up somebody else opportunity to uh, minister to this to somebody in need as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men all men even those who are not born again they have a need you don't want to, them to die of hunger before they get saved minister to them and he says, especially now unto them who are the household of faith. And the Lord help us to do that according to his will, according to his word, in Jesus' name. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect says that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. How is it that person has need and there's no brother, no sister in that community that can even look into that need and then another person has a need and then everybody is rallying around and they're giving much more than the fellow needs. Meanwhile, this one is dying of hunger, this one is dying of pressure and burden, and the other one has more than enough. It says we should do nothing by partiality. Let's love like Jesus loved, and let's love like the head of the body. And then all the members of the body will minister to one another without preferring one before another and without any partiality. Let's come to number three now. 
Point number three, prescribed responsibilities of ministers are sealed by God. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 18, And God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly preach teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, health, governments, diversities of tongues. It tells us in verse 31, in verse 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Why do you covet earnestly the best gifts? I want to be of more help to people. I want to lift up other people. I want to minister to the needs of people. And because I am handicapped at present, I'm not able to offer all the help I want to offer. That's why I'm praying earnestly that God will give me the best gifts so I'll be able to minister to more of the members of the body of Christ and yet I show to you a more excellent way there's an excellent way of ministering to people there's an excellent method of sharing what we have unto people and it's the way of love everything we offer we offer in love prescribed responsibility as members see as ministers sealed by God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the appointed ministry of apostles and other ministers. Number two, the assigned ministry of ambassadors and all members. Number three, the acceptable motive for of aspiring for more. Let's look at number one, the appointed ministry of apostles and other ministers. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, but the apostles are not the only ministers, there are other ministers. Uh, secondly, prophets, thirdly, teachers, and that's not the end of the ministers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, health, governments, administration, and diversities of tongues. Those are the apostles and the other ministers. And God has appointed their ministry. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. And he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers why? What's their responsibility? Let's look at verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what we all do with united effort. We're useful to the body of Christ. We edify, we teach, we train, we mature the saints of God. In verse 13, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a matured man, a competent man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then in verse 14, it says that we as for be no more children when those ministers, when they minister to us and their ministries unite to edify the church. It says we'll be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in which to deceive. In Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 23. We're reading from verse 4. And I will search up shepherds over them. That's the decision of God. That's the prerogative of God that is said 
church, the ministers in the body as it has pleased him. And here is his promise, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. When the ministers minister appropriately, all the lacks in the body of Christ will be supplied. All the lacks in our church, the Lord will supply in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 3, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to my own heart not according to their heart you know pastors if the pastors come and they only minister according to their heart and they determine this is the way i'm going to talk to them and this is the way i'm going to do it will not agree with god if we're going to minister and minister to the needs of the people our own mind our own heart our own idea our own self-will all that should be thrown away and now we minister according to the mind of God which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding Acts chapter 20 we're looking at verse 28 take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood the lord gave us the mind of christ to always appreciate the church of god and minister to them appropriately in jesus name look at number two number two is the assigned ministry of ambassadors and all ministers it's not only the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and the miracle workers and those who have the gifts of healing all of us if we're waiting for that we don't all have the apostolic ministry look at first corinthians chapter 12 verse 29 are all apostles the answer is no are all prophets the answer is no are all teachers the answer is no are all workers of miracles the answer is no look at verse 30 have all the gifts of healing the answer is no do all speak with tongues the answer is no do all interpret the answer is no well if not everybody if everybody does not have all these gifts where do you come in as members of the body of Christ, you come in as ambassadors of Christ. You might not be an apostle, but you are an ambassador of Christ. The assigned ministry of ambassadors and all members in Second Corinthians chapter five. We're reading from verse eighteen. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and he has given unto us everyone the ministry of reconciliation verse 19 and, uh, uh, to which that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation verse 20 it says now then we are ambassadors for christ you are i am we are all ambassadors for christ as though god did beseech you by us we pray you in christ's search be ye reconciled to God. That's the reason we read in Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4, realizing we're all ambassadors as members of the body of Christ, and he has committed into our hands the ministry of reconciliation. It says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? preaching the word they didn't leave the preaching only to the apostles 
only to the prophets, only to the teachers, only to the workers of miracles, everyone, everyone, all the members of the church, as they were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the acceptable motive of aspiring for more. You want more of the grace of God, more of the gift of God, and more of the ability of the Spirit that you'll be able to do more. What's the motive? What motivates you? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 31, but covet honestly the best gifts. You're an apostle, covet honestly the best gifts that will make you your best as an apostle. A teacher, covet honestly the best gifts that will make you your best as a teacher. Or you are an evangelist, covet honestly the best gifts that will make you the best as your minister and you fulfill the great commission. You are an ambassador of Christ. Covet honestly the best gifts and as you covet those gifts and you look up to the Lord and the Lord grants you more of the gifts, you'll be a better servant of God, a better child of God in ministry as ambassadors in Jesus' name. Covet honestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And as you discover the excellent way of love, every time you minister, you will pray, Oh God, help me not just to talk, not just to help, not just to govern, not just to lift up other people, not just to edify them, not just to serve them. Help me to have an excellent spirit, a loving spirit, so that my motive and the way I minister will lift up many more people. The Lord effect that in every one of our lives. In Jesus' name. As we ask in faith, it will grant unto us. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. In Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 3. It tells us, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. If you have sought out the more excellent way, there is no envy, there's no strife, there's no vain glory when you are ministering in an excellent way, but only in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> in verse 4 look not every man on his own things don't say i'm going to have my way and uh, whether they like it or not i'll pounce on them i'll crush them i'm the pastor i am the evangelist i'm the teacher i'm the leader and if they don't like my method let them go and find another pastor it says no it says look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others in verse 5 let this might be in you which was also in Christ Jesus in verse 6 it says in verse 6 who being in the form of God thought it not trouble to be equal with God and then in verse 7 he made himself of no reputation made himself of no reputation you're not looking for the praise of men and you're not looking for reputation you're not looking for honor all you want to do is to serve the body of Christ and be your best for them so that you lift them up out of their feebleness, out of their weakness, out of their predicament and out of the challenges they have. Made himself of no reputation but he took upon him the form of a servant, a servant who wants to serve and was made in the likeness of men. I pray the grace of God will become more abundant in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. You'll be a better minister. Say amen. 
you'll be a better member of the church amen you'll be a better ambassador of christ everywhere you go in jesus name and all the grace you need and all the gifts you need the lord will supply you will be your best and your service will be profitable and rewardable both here in life and in eternity in jesus name i say amen for you let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer that all that we have learned today the lord himself will reproduce in us the grace abundance of the grace of god to be as good as we ought to be in serving the lord and serving the body of christ open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer <laughs> 